Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our first actual unit back to school. Um, this unit is just our getting started unit. It's kind of an introduction to environmental science. The topic for today is going to be environmental indicators. So like always, let me get you your objectives and we'll get started. So by the end of this video, two things I need you to be able to do. First is to define the term ecosystem service, and the second is to explain each of the five major environmental indicators. Today we're going to look at basically how environmental scientists gauge whether or not an ecosystem is healthy. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about the idea of an ecosystem service. This is something that we're going to circle back on quite a lot throughout the course of the year. And basically an ecosystem service are things that the earth provides for us, usually things that we could not do for ourselves. So this would include things like filtering the air, pollinating our plants, growing crops, providing building materials, filtering water, all that good stuff are ecosystem services. And they're things that humans might be able to do for ourselves, but for the most part, if we were to do them, it would be entirely too expensive. Think about it, we can't build a giant filter to filter out all of the air in the world. So those things that the earth does for us that we can't do for ourselves is an ecosystem service. And Environmental scientists look at things called environmental indicators. Ecosystem services can be a type of environmental indicator, but basically environmental indicators let us know if there's a problem on the earth. And there are long lists of environmental indicators that you can find in your book. We're going to focus on five major ones today, and these are things that if environmental scientists see a problem in one of these areas in an ecosystem, they know that there's a problem within that ecosystem or within the planet as a general. And I had a temperature, uh, not a temperature thing, a thermometer there on the side because, you know, thermometers gauge whether or not something's wrong in your body. So environmental indicators kind of gauge whether or not something is wrong with the planet. So the first of our five major environmental indicators is biodiversity. Biodiversity is the amount of genetic or living material that is available in an area. Living material is not quite right because that'd be more biomass, um, but biodiversity is just kind of the number and the variety of organisms living in an area. Biodiversity can be broken down into three main types. There is genetic biodiversity. Genetic diversity is basically the amount of gene combinations or the availability of genes within a population of organisms. So if a population of organisms has high genetic diversity, that means that it's probably going to be a healthier population that's going to be more resistant to diseases because let's say a disease comes along, if some of the animals in the population have a gene that's resistant to the disease, they will survive, where if there was not genetic diversity and some of the animals didn't have that gene, the whole population would be wiped out. So genetic diversity is an excellent thing, provides resilience within a population. There is species biodiversity, and this is within, e within an ecosystem, the variety of animals that is present. So places like a rainforest have got high species biodiversity, places like a desert have got fairly low species biodiversity. Usually the more biodiversity that is present in an area on the species level, the healthier that ecosystem is. Because if you think about it, a healthy ecosystem is going to be able to provide more food and more food provides greater opportunity for species to live in the area. And then the final level of biodiversity is ecosystem biodiversity. This is looking at a planet scale, so looking at the globe as a whole. The more ecosystems that are present on Earth, generally the healthier the planet is. Um, if the earth is for whatever reason out of whack then it's possible that ecosystems will be disappearing and that would be indicating that the earth is probably not in good shape. So be aware of those three types of biodiversity and we're going to move on to our next environmental indicator which is extinction rates. Now extinction rate is the rate at which an anim which animals around the world go extinct and um, being extinct obviously means that it is gone and not coming back. Um, the general rate of extinction, known as the background extinction rate, is about one species per year. So in the world, undisturbed by humans, about one species will go extinct naturally a year. Scientists have found that currently somewhere between five and 10,000 species per year are going extinct. So this means that the current rate of extinction is five to 10,000 times the background rate or the natural rate of extinction. Most of those extinctions are the result of habitat loss, so people um, destroying habitat for either you know agricultural purposes or for building materials or for us to live in. So be aware that 
higher extinction rates usually indicate that something is wrong within the planet. Sorry, forgive the light outage and the strange move there for a second. Our third environmental indicator is going to be food production. Now, this is where we get into one of those environmental tensions. There is a tension between an adequate food supply for people and ecosystem health. Human population is growing. We'll talk about that more in a second. But obviously, a growing human population is going to need more food. But raising more food can do two things. One, you could lose habitat because people are going to cut down forests and grasslands in order to plant crops. And um, farming the soil more intensively is going to lead to soil degradation. So producing food for people is a great thing, but a lot of times we run into the problem of, all right, we need food for people, but producing more food for people degrades the environment. So generally speaking, the amount of food that an area can produce is an indicator of environmental health. Healthy environments can produce more food, while environments that are less healthy cannot produce as much food. All right, second to last environmental indicator, and this is one that you guys have probably heard about a lot. This is the connection between global temperature and global carbon dioxide, or CO2, rates. Now, over time, going back, geez, 400,000 years or so, and we'll talk about how they know this later on in the year, but there's a general trend that has been shown that says that when there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperatures are generally higher around the world, and when there is a low amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then temperatures are generally lower around the world. This graph right here shows you the um, temperatures since 1880 and the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere since 1880. And you can see that there is a general trend. You know, in the 1880s, CO2 car or CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was much lower than it is now, and you can also see that by the blue lines, the average global temperature was also a lot lower. So we're seeing that as carbon dioxide concentrations are going up, temperatures are going up along with them. Problem with this is, a lot of the technology that humans use today put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I'll show you one little thing. You've probably heard of the Industrial Revolution where people started using fuels, machines to do work. That happened right around this area. Before this time, humans were burning, you know, like coal, or probably not so much coal, more wood and biomass. But in the 1880s, we started to switch to fossil fuels like coal and oil and stuff like that. And as the world became more mechanized and started using more of those machines, those machines were putting more carbon dioxide into the air. And that's why we see a rising carbon dioxide concentration, because a lot of the technologies we use put out that carbon dioxide. So in your head, have that connection. As CO2 concentration goes up, generally we see an upward trend in temperature as well. And our final environmental indicator for the day is the human population as a whole. Presently, there are 7 billion people on the air, 7 billion and some change. And the global concentration looks like it is still rising rapidly. Um, it's predicted that human population will probably level out somewhere between 8 and 10 million in the, or 10 billion in the year 2100. Um, but for the next probably, I don't know, 60, 70 years, the global population is going to continue to rise fairly rapidly. One of the things that's difficult about this is most of the population growth is happening in the least developed part of the world. So more people are being born into the areas that are least equipped to support a growing human population. And obviously, this is difficult because a larger human population means greater demand for resources that greater demand for resources puts more strain on the earth. It also means that as there are more people on the earth, more waste is produced and more pollution is produced, and those are things that have to be dealt with as well. And I was wrong. There is one more environmental indicator hiding out here, and that is resource depletion itself. I know that picture on the right is one of the saddest pictures ever, but it illustrates what I'm talking about. So human development is a double-edged sword. I just talked about a growing global population. As global populations grow, obviously people need more resources. And the goal of the UN and most world organizations is to raise people up into a higher standard of living. So we don't want people living in poverty. We want people to be able to enjoy a nice, long, healthy, comfortable life. Great for the people, not so good for the planet. Because if you remember, we talked about in our past series, as people are more developed, as they live a more comfortable lifestyle, they also use more resources. So as the global population is growing, and people are moving up into better lifestyles, more and more resources are being um, consumed and 
our planet has finite resources. There are some resources that once they are gone, they're gone. Things like most metals and mineral resources, once they're gone, we can't get more of them. Things like biomass resources like trees and crops and stuff, they will be here if we use them sustainably. And remember, uh, using something sustainably means to meet our needs now while not hurting the ability of the future generations to meet their needs. So human population is growing, human development is good, but it puts strains on the natural resources. And that is it. I have finished everything I need to cover for the day. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.